Hello 100 terawatt hour members, friends and sympathizers. My name is Dirk van der Voorde, I'm an industrial engineer electricity and I'm going to help you understand the working principle of the molten salt reactor. Without distinguishing between the different types of nuclear power plants under construction. And after this lecture, you can ask me questions directly or via my email address. I also dare to promote my book, Rip Fossile Brandstof, which offers one of the solution methods to slowly stop fossil fuel. Not investing in gas or coal power plants, but slowly phasing them out by offering an alternative to the emerging countries so that they don't start with coal power plants like we used to do to build their wealth. So, most people think that in the future, nuclear energy will be the most used energy on Earth. Wrong! This will not happen. Too expensive. You know, nuclear power plants are still much cheaper than wind power, but not competitive with coal power plants. Why is nuclear power so expensive and how? Can those costs go down? Either we build cheap reactors or we build safe reactors. Doing both is a challenge. We see that from 1983 the cost per kilowatt hour for a nuclear power plant quickly became more expensive than the kilowatt hour supplied by a coal plant. And we have to focus on coal plants because the emerging countries want to build them to grow in wealth. Even Germany, our misguided model country, is betting on coal-fired power plants. But Belgium will soon not be much better with its nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide emitting gas plants. So we need to ask ourselves, what was the trigger for almost all previous disasters? Why are our existing nuclear power plants not using fuel sustainably. Why is there a need to invest heavily in additional containment buildings, additional passive safe systems, additional safeties on safeties? Why is the efficiency or the return only about 30%? Well, everything, but everything has to do with the fuel and the water, as coolant and moderator. New sources of carbon-free energy are exploring a reactor concept first introduced in the 1950s and 60s. The Molten Salt Reactor. The first molten salt reactor experiments were conducted by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The design was radical for its time and offered many advantages worth a fresh look today. So most of the existing reactors operate with solid uranium oxide pellets. They are incredibly stable and strong, but during the stay in the reactor, they produce about 60 times their volume in gas, which remains locked in the pellet. Certain dangerous isotopes of cesium and iodine are safely stored in those pellets and in the zirconium tubes until things go wrong. Think of a meltdown that occurs when pellets, fuel pellets, and their zirconium protection tubes melt due to lack or total loss of coolant water. To avoid this in the future, many additional measures have been taken. 
all measures related to the fuel and the coolant, which pushed up the price of a nuclear power plant from 1983. So, if we eliminate solid fuel pellets, if we eliminate water as a coolant and a reactor vessel along with the primary circuit under high pressure, then the extra safety measures such as an extra containment building in concrete or in steel, extra passive cooling and extra control systems disappear, right? But it is not all. Those super strong pellets and fuel elements requires a lot of time and work to be manufactured. And the process of making pellets from uranium ore is hardly environmentally friendly. As already seen, the preparation of the fuel rods involves many preparatory steps. All these operations serve only to prepare the fuel. If, in addition, much higher temperatures can be achieved so that more heat is converted into electrical energy, with other words, to increase the thermodynamic efficiency, then the total price of a nuclear power plant must fall, right? Making solid fuel is an expensive, complicated and polluting process. Solid fuel must be removed early because, first, the pellets crack and expand and treat to damage the gladding, the zirconium tubes. And secondly, the fission products eat more and more neutrons, so treatening to shut down the reactor. And thirdly, the fission products also contain gases that increase the pressure in the cladding, in the zirconium tubes. This is why the fuel is replaced every four years. This waste is actually still pure fuel, 96%. And uh, during the solid fuel replacement, the reactor must be shut down. There is an exception uh, with the Kandu reactor. He does not. But if the solid reactor rods get too hot due to leak of cooling, we speak of a meltdown. This is impossible with a molten salt reactor, since the whole reactor is already in a molten state. In our pressurized water reactors, we work with water at high pressure, 150 bar, and at a temperature of 340 degrees Celsius. That water serves as a moderator and as a coolant. Sorry, I will explain later what a moderator is. In the molten salt reactor, we work at atmospheric pressure and very high temperature over the 600 degrees Celsius. Here, the molten salt in which the fuel is bound serves as a coolant. So, why a molten salt reactor? Allow me to ask an initial question. Why work with a molten salt solution when we have already accumulated over the 50 years of experience with solid fuel and water as a coolant and a moderator. Well, the problem with solid fuel rods, as in a light water reactor, is that you have to shut down the reactor to replace the fuel rods. A liquid salt solution that serves as a fuel as well as a heat transfer offers other advantages. For example, the heat transfer in a molten salt is much more direct. It is also much easier to control the criticality of the reactor. For example, by increasing the ratio of salt solution in the fuel, in the fissile, the reactor will become less critical and stabilize at a lower temperature. The reactor fuel is also easier to store through a passive cooling system. And while the reactor is operating, it is possible to continuously drain a quantity of saline solution to check its composition and refill the fuel, rid it of harmful neutron absorbing and or 
highly oxidizing fissile material and also control the quantity of fissile and breeder elements. Sorry, I will explain what breeder elements are later. This is not possible in today's solid fuel light water reactors. So the fuel has to leave the reactor much earlier. And this is why our light water reactors cannot be called sustainable. They removed fuel rods and still 96% pure fuel for the molten salt reactor. So our nuclear power plants are not sustainable. Therefore, they must close. But not yet, because we have nothing that is good enough to replace them. Their nuclear waste is not waste. No. Pure fuel, 96%, is still fissionable in the fast reactors under construction, as the molten salt fast reactor, and in the already existing sodium-cooled fast reactors like the Russian BN600, the BN800, etc. Thorium-232 is without doubt much more abundant than uranium and can provide an enormous source of energy. With only 6,600 tons of thorium, we can cover the annual global energy consumption. By that I mean 5 billion tons of coal plus 31 billion barrels of oil plus a little 3,000 billion cubic meter of natural gas and 65,000 tons of uranium. And thorium does not need to be enriched and requires at least 10 times less mining compared to the light water reactor. And sorry, but now I have to explain a few things first. What is a fast reactor? What is a moderator? And what do we split at the thorium reactor? And what is a breeder reactor? In our Belgium pressurized water reactor, we work with pellets that consist of 4% uranium-235. I will explain the 235. An uranium atom consists always of 92 protons, and uranium is ranked on the table of Mendeleev on place 92. And uranium have 143 neutrons. I explain. 92 protons plus 143 neutrons are 235 nucleons. And the rest is uranium-238. So also with uh, 92 protons, otherwise it's not uranium, but now with 146 neutrons. So uranium-235 and uranium-238 are two isotopes of uranium. And now you can follow on the slide below. If we shoot a uranium-235 atomic nucleus with a neutron, there is much or little chance that this neutron will be absorbed and not scatter or bounce off. This creates a uranium-236 atomic nucleus. However, this is a very unstable or radioactive atom that decays rapidly by splitting into two fragments and two or three fast neutrons. Fast neutrons or neutrons with a lot of energy, about plus minus two mega electrovolts. These fast neutrons must cause a nuclear reaction so that the reactor does not shut down. But fast neutrons are absorbed much more difficult than slow neutrons by large atomic nuclei. And the size of the red circles, which you can see on the figure, represent the absorption probability. 
and the size of the blue circles represent the fission probability after absorbing of a neutron. At first, it looks better to work with slow neutrons, so we need to slow down the fast released neutrons. And we do that with a moderator. In our Belgium uh, pressurized water reactors, we will use water as a coolant, but also as a moderator. So we know that water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Both atoms are excellent moderators. You can see that on the figure. After each fission of a uranium atom, the fast neutrons leave the nucleus. And they collide many times with the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms in the cooling water. After each collision, they lose speed and energy so that they become slow or thermal neutrons. And thermal neutrons are gladly absorbed by a next uranium nucleus, which then in turn splits and continues the chain reaction. And since we do not use water in the thorium molten salt reactor, we can use graphite as a moderator. We see that for every uranium-235 that fissions, two to three neutrons are released, since our pressurized water reactor requires only one neutron to continue the chain reaction, we need to be able to control the number of neutrons. If the water at the pressurized water reactor starts boiling and forms a lot of bubbles, the neutrons will be moderated less and the nuclear reaction will stop. We call that negative void coefficient. That void of uh, emptiness refers to the air bubbles. But since the intention is not to boil the water between the reactor rods, we use control rods. And control rods consist of neutron absorbing material that is very happy to absorb neutrons but does not fission. In a pressurized water reactor, if we leave the control rods completely in place in the reactor, they absorb all the neutrons and the reactor shut down. However, post-cooling is required because the radioactive fission elements in the pellets are continuously decaying into more stable elements and generating heat, a lot of heat. Without aftercooling, we get the meltdown. So the reactor core consists of pellets and zirconium tubes are melting. In the thorium molten salt reactor, a meltdown is not possible because everything is already melt. And later, we shall see that the thorium molten salt reactor regulate the chain reaction automatically, without any control device. On the figure we see that thorium atomic nuclei do take up neutrons, see the red sphere. But the thorium nuclei do not split after taking up a neutron. No blue is seen. Oui, indeed, if we shoot the thorium-232 atom with a neutron, see top figure, and the neutron is absorbed, then we obtain a radioactive or unstable thorium-233 atom. Now let's explain this step by step. Well, thorium-232 is little radioactive, or in other words, little unstable. And you can see that from its great half-life of 14 billion years. But when that thorium-232 atomic nucleus picks up one neutron, it becomes thorium-233. And thorium-233 is highly radioactive after 
22 minutes half-life of the thorium-233 will have decayed to protactinium-233. And yes, you heard correctly, a thorium core suddenly becomes a protactinium core, because a neutron in the thorium core suddenly changes into a proton and an electron. The electron is catapulted out of the nucleus in the process and is harmful to all living things. We call this beta radiation. And we're moving on. The protactinium nuclei are highly radioactive and decay in the same way to uranium-233 nuclei. And those uranium-233 nuclei are little radioactive. In other words, little unstable. Indeed, back the same kind of decay. A neutron in the protactinium-233 nucleus has changed it to a proton. That nucleus now has 92 protons. It's no longer a protactinium atom, but a uranium-233 atom, with 92 protons and 141 neutrons. And uh, be aware, such a nucleus that decays always falls to a lower energy level. The difference in energy level is emitted. And yes, this is often called radioactive radiation, which is wrong. It is high energy radiation, and in this case, beta radiation. Now, the uranium-233 is little radioactive, so we have time to shoot it with a neutron. Notice, or be aware, we already needed a neutron to make thorium-232 decay to uranium-233. This is, therefore, a second neutron that we need. If the second neutron hits and it is absorbed by the uranium nucleus, then we get a uranium-234 atom. And this atom is extremely unstable and splits into two pieces 91% of the time. And on the slide, we see that uranium-233 nuclei likes to pick up neutrons, the red sphere, but after taking up a neutron, also like to split the blue sphere. Indeed, if uranium-233 picks up a neutron, it will split into two chunks and two or three neutrons in over 90% of the cases. Good to know, when an atomic nucleus splits, no nuclear particles are lost. On the slide we see one example of fission and let us count 137 xenon particles plus 94 strontium particles plus 3 fast neutrons equals 234 particles or nucleons. And we also see that on average 200 mega electrovolt of heat is released. This is huge compared to the 9 electrovolt of heat released by burning one methane molecule, for example. After a long introduction, we can now begin to look at the operation of the thorium reactor. And we see here two vessels of salt solution. The green inner vessel and around it the blue mantle vessel, both separated by a steel wall. Neither salt vessel is under pressure. The mantle vessel or jacket vessel in blue contains a salt solution containing thorium, namely lithium fluoride, beryllium difluoride and thorium tetrafluoride. This salt is also called breeder salt or mantle salt. 
and the inner vessel or the reactor vessel in green contains the same salt solution but not with thorium but only with fissionable uranium-233. Yes, and to start a new reactor, we do need to have a certain amount of fissile material. Uranium-233 or uranium-235 or a little plutonium-239 or use a Kickstarter, Californium-252. And for your information, a salt that is an ionic bound between a metal and a non-metal. Here, the metals are lithium, beryllium, thorium and uranium, and the non-metal is fluorine. Ion bounds are one of the strongest electromagnetic bounds that exist. The lithium and the beryllium serve to give the salt even better properties, such as high boiling point, low melting point, no uh, evaporating quickly, etc. In principle, this also works with table salt, sodium chloride. The liquid fuel is ionically bonded, not covalently bonded, so it is impervious to radiation damage. It will not be altered in its properties by the withering radiation environment inside the reactor. It has a wonderful liquid range of about 1,000 degrees C. You have to get it to a certain temperature before it'll melt, but once you get it to that point, it will stay liquid for a tremendous range. Contrast that with water, which is what we use, which only has 100 degrees C of liquid range at standard pressure. We increase that liquid range by putting it under tremendous pressures, but therein is, is a risk. Yes, and let's now talk about the green vessel. In the reactor vessel, just the green one, Nuclear fission in the fuel salt occurs spontaneously or by force. Broken pieces or fission elements and neutrons are produced. But most importantly, a lot of heat. And the heat is transferred from the reactor vessel to the primary heat exchanger, salt salt, by the primary pump P. And the secondary circuit, you can see it on the slide, orange-yellow, moves the heat through an item, salt, lithium fluoride, beryllium defluoride, but without uranium and without thorium, without fission elements, we call it non-radioactive salt, to a second heat exchanger, salt gas. And here a gas, yes, a hot gas, helium or CO2, is heated to drive a gas turbine. The gas turbine drives a generator that generates electricity and a compressor that recompresses the exhausted gas. The expanded gas that is still very hot, more than 500 degrees Celsius, can be further cooled by extracting it and using it as process heat for purposes such as seawater desalination, hydrogen production, etc. Or an additional thermodynamic circuit to produce steam. So we obtain two circuits that produce electricity. The first is a Brayton cycle, nuclear heats up a gas, you know, 500 degrees Celsius and more, gas turbine, cooler, compressor. And secondly, a Rankin cycle. We heat up water to steam, steam turbine, condenser and pump. In this process, the efficiency will increase to over 60%, which is almost double. Now that this exhaust gas has released its energy as far as possible, it is pumped to the compressor in order to be offered back to the secondary heat exchanger. There, to absorb energy and repeat the cycle. Be also aware that such a gas turbine is 5 to 10 times smaller than a steam turbine for the same power. Now, the fuel salt will expand as it heats up, resulting in fewer fissionable uranium nuclei in the reactor, or in other words, 
the atomic nuclei will be further apart. And as a result, there are fewer fissions, fewer neutrons, and the nuclear reaction stops. As the fuel salt cools, the nuclei come closer together again, causing the neutrons to collide with the nuclei more frequently and the nuclear fission to resume. Put another way, when the reactor gets hotter, its ability to generate heat goes down, and conversely, when the reactor gets cooler, its ability to generate heat goes up. These two effects ensure that the reactor stabilizes itself and always adjusts itself to the demand for electricity from the grid. Therefore, this reactor regulates itself without control equipment. The fuel salt in the reactor can heat up and cool down between wide margins. So between 500 and uh, 1400 degrees Celsius without boiling or solidifying. A meltdown, steam explosion, hydrogen explosion, etc. as in Fukushima or Three Miles Island is excluded here since the core has already melted. Neither water nor hydrogen is formed and neither the reactor vessel nor the primary circuit are under pressure. So this type of reactor is more likely to shut down than run uncontrollably because we have to be very economical with our neutron budget. Only two or three neutrons are released in each fission and two neutrons are needed to keep the reactor going. One neutron to turn a thorium atom into a uranium atom and a second neutron to split this uranium atom. We will soon see that neutrons are sometimes lost. And now the blue vessel? The thorium atoms in the mantle vessel are continuously bombarded by neutrons coming from the reactor vessel. Thorium atoms absorb that neutron and decay into unstable radioactive protactinium atoms. Attention! Protactinium contaminates the salt mixture. The green vessel. So, in the reactor vessel, fission elements accumulate after a while and certain fission elements also tend to take up neutrons without fissioning. This must be avoided as much as possible or the nuclear reactor will shut down. And in the blue vessel, so the breeder vessel, more and more protactinium nuclei are formed in the breeder salt. It takes 27 days, the half-life, for this protactinium to convert to uranium-233 fuel. But protactinium-233 atoms like to absorb neutrons. Again, this causes neutrons to be lost, neutrons that do not contribute to keeping the reactor going. So the both vessels will need to be continuously cleaned. And I start with the green vessel. Continuously from the green core, quantities of salt mixture containing uranium and fission products are pumped out to the chemical processing plant, which filters out the fission products and sorts them according to waste, usable medical products or useful products for space exploration. And the fuel salt that has been stripped of fission products is then pumped back into the reactor vessel, the green vessel, for further fission. And now the blue vessel. So from the blue vessel, a quantity of the mantle salt with uranium, thorium and protactinium in it 
is routinely pumped to a chemical processing plant. The protactinium-233 is purged out and put in the holding chamber outside the reactor vessel for over a month until it decays to uranium-233. And then the bread or cultivated uranium-233 is systematically isolated and pumped to the reactor vessel green, where it can be split. The thorium is also isolated and systematically pumped to the mantle salt blue, where it can be converted to protactinium. The process can be summarized like this. Blanket salt comes out of the reactor after being bombarded by neutrons and it passes through the first redox phase going against a steady flow of bismuth. Protactinium and uranium are removed and the remaining blanket salt flows back into the reactor to keep generating new fuel. This process is repeated yet again through another redox column and then reaches the electrolyte cell to be oxidized and turned into fluorides, separating them from the bismuth, keeping the cycle going. The oxidized protactinium is taken into a tank called DK tank, where it is isolated for about two months to get as much uranium as possible. At this stage, uranium tether fluoride is still a liquid and in order to be removed from the rest of the liquid, is introduced into a fluorination column. This is possible because uranium is the only element in the mix that can be further oxidized by fluor, which turns into a gas or uranium hexafluoride. At this point, uranium hexafluoride is pushed into another reduction column that comes into contact with hydrogen, become hydrogen fluoride and uranium tether fluoride, or a liquid again. This liquid goes into the reactor and the hydrogen fluoride goes back into the electrolytic cell that splits hydrogen from fluor and the cycle keeps going. This liquid streams into the third and most important redox column that removes all of the fission products from the liquid, leaving no traces of actinides among other fission products. Now we have uranium being sent to the core for the reaction to take place. Now let's talk about safety. After the pressurized water reactor is shut down, there is still heat generation from the decay heat of the fission products in the fuel rods. So the operator must ensure that the fuel rods do not become too hot. After cooling is necessary to prevent a meltdown. The molten salt reactor is designed with a simple plug of solidified salt freeze valve in the bottom of the reactor vessel. If the event of total power failure, tsunami, earthquake, overheating, when all operators leave the plant, etc., the solidified salt plug melts and the fuel salt runs by gravity into a storage tank, drain tank, ending the fission process that when power is lost, the reactor will drain itself passively into a configuration where decay heat can be rejected to the environment. This is such a remarkable feature, and it really is unique to having this liquid fuel form and to having something that can operate at standard pressure. All the equipment, uh, the, uh, there's a, a drain valve, uh, they call it a, a freeze valve, that's normally kept frozen with, with salt in it, and on loss of power, the cooling goes away, the, the temperature of the salt goes up to the point where it's liquid, that's about 450 centigrade Celsius, and it automatically uh, drains into one of these uh, tanks, so it's, it's safe from there on. This simple feature prevents the meltdown scenario from occurring and allows the reactor to be shut down and restart quickly and easily. So the molten salt reactor is an inherently safe, intrinsically stable and self-regulating design that makes it impossible for accidents that have occurred in nuclear power plants in the past to repeat themselves. Complex and expensive safety measures that drive up the price of the current light water reactors are unnecessary here. The reactor core, the mantle vessel and the primary circuit all operate at garden hose pressure, 
without steam. So a leak, a sudden drop in pressure or an explosion are unlikely. An inherent stability is provided by a very negative thermal reactivity coefficient. A molten salt plant would produce 4,000 times less mining waste and 1,000 to 10,000 times less nuclear waste than a water reactor. And because molten salt reactors can be designed to process almost all their fuel, the majority of the waste products, 83%, are safely stabilized within 10 years and the rest the 17% within 300 years. And the molten salt reactor technology can also be used to split the existing waste from our water reactors. This turns the extremely expensive waste into suddenly pure fuel that makes money. In Belgium, our nuclear waste, the size of a soccer field, 50 cm high, can provide us with electricity and process heat for industry for 1,000 years. And then our waste height is reduced from 50 cm high to only 5 mm high, with a storage time of only 300 years. An analogy I like to make with people is uh, the old pressurized water reactors we have are a lot like a landline phone. It's really, really good and reliable at one thing. And some of these newer reactors like New Scale, small, S small light water SMRs are kind of like a flip phone. They're, they're nifty and neat and they, and they do that one thing in a new and, and, and kind of exciting way. But what we're after is analogous to a smartphone. We want to not just do electricity, but we want to do many things. We want to produce heat, water, medicine, and many more products through the harnessing of all of the parts of the fission reaction. And, and this is what we feel the, the new latitude and, 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 oper and opportunities that are being presented by the Department of Energy allow. And so we're very, very excited about this. Ultimately, our goal is to supply the world with energy and water and fuel that have all of the attributes that the public expects and demands. We believe that, that through this molten salt technology, we're going to be able to get there. We're very excited. Thank you very much. And so far, the thermal molten salt reactor with slow neutrons and with graphite channels in the reactor core as moderator. But Europe is working on a fast molten salt reactor. Samovar is a partnership between 11 international universities and research centers. They want to build a fast molten salt reactor and thus achieve a breakthrough in the nuclear safety and waste management. This type of reactor must be outstanding in physical and chemical terms. In the choice of materials for the reactor core, the reprocessing plant and the waste processing plant, but also in terms of sustainability and safety. The coordinator of this project is Jan Leen Kloosterman, who is a professor at TU Delft. During reactor operation, it is also advisable at this fast reactor to continuously extract fission products. A quantity of fuel salt mixture can be continuously sent to the salt treatment unit. So there is permanent control over the physical and the chemical composition and properties of the salt and over any erosion and or corrosion phenomena. So the fuel treatment unit will continuously remove fission products from the fuel salt and keep the redox potential of the salt within the correct range to minimize corrosion. Only 40 of the 80,000 liters salt solution per day will be pumped out of the reactor for control purposes. But also to rid the reactor salt of fission products 
and then pump it back into the reactor without fission products. In this fast molten salt reactor, the fuel volume is about 700 times larger and the pollution increases in percentage terms much less than in a thermal molten salt reactor. Of course, you might ask why a fast reactor has 700 times more salt fuel mixture than the slow reactor. You do remember that fast neutrons are much less likely to be absorbed by large atomic nuclei than slow neutrons. If I enlarge those small circles on the figure, we see that fast neutrons are still absorbed by large atomic nuclei. But if we now increase the amount of fissile material 700 times, then the probability of absorbing will also increase 700 times. This is the reason for the large volume of molten salt and fissile material. But what is extremely important is that once absorbed into the nucleus, they will fission in many more cases. Even thorium and protactinium nuclei will sometimes fission. This is a major advantage for the fast molten salt reactor. These reactors can use a broad range of fuel and salt compositions, and there are even designs that do not require a moderator at all and are a class called fast reactors. Several designs would employ thorium fuel, which offers many benefits. There is at least three times more thorium than uranium on the planet. And its waste largely decays in hundreds of years instead of tens of thousands. Other advantages of molten salt reactors include safety and efficiency. Replacing water as the coolant removes possibility of steam explosions and generation of flammable hydrogen gas. Low pressure operation also places less demand on containment systems. The nuclear reactions are easier to control because liquid salt expands. In the event of an unanticipated rise in temperature, this expansion shuts down the reaction. Additionally, a freeze plug can dump the fuel into tanks and stop the reaction. This option provides a failsafe in the event of power outages or other events. Because these reactors can operate at higher temperature, their steam cycle generates electricity more efficiently. The use of liquid fuel allows for real-time waste processing. And finally, there is no need to shut down the reactor for refueling. New fuel can be introduced to the system during operation. So we can conclude that the sustainability of our light water reactors splitting the uranium-235 is low. And also thorium-232 and uranium-233, etc. and nuclear waste from our current light water reactors can be burned in the molten salt fast reactor but also thorium-232 and uranium-233 can also be burned in the thermal molten salt reactors, making these reactors very sustainable. For both reactors, the liquid fuel state also provides flexibility in the fuel cycle. So various cleaning, reprocessing, refilling and disposal techniques can only be applied to a liquid fuel. So the molten salt reactor can combine sustainability with passive safety, economy and proliferation resistance. And let us hope that the fast and the thermal molten salt reactor projects receives sufficient support to build a commercial one as soon as possible, as a competitor to the many coal-fired power plants under construction. 
So, if we need 30 times more electricity globally, when global warming is really that life-threatening, when it is 5 to 12, if there are more than 1,400 coal-fired power plants on the shuttle, if we can't breathe in the big cities anymore, when millions of people die from polluted air, if billions of people have neither electricity nor sanitary facilities, then we should not concern ourselves with pettiness, such as better isolation, a private solar panel, wind mice, economy, tree planting or becoming a vegetarian. No, then we must first employ the crude means, a compact, modular, powerful, abundant, cheap, sustainable, easy to operate, seri-producted power machine. <laughs>